Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a very important topic, which I'm going to speak for next uh, 20 minutes and with some demonstration. And even if I'm able to um, establish the importance of this topic in anyone present in this hall and all the steps required for the basic and advanced life support, then definitely we will be able to solve, we will be able to save lots of life. So just starting with the topic, the topic is systematic approach to an emergency patient. Now, what is the requirement of the systematic approach? Whenever we have a acutely ill or injured patient, we need to give a very systematic approach for optimal care. What is the goal? What is the goal of this systematic approach? The goal is that we have to support and restore the oxygenation, ventilation, circulation, and with the intact neurological outcome in any patient. Now, what should be the actions for the systematic approach? The actions are divided into three important steps. BLS assessment, that is basic life support assessment, primary assessment, and secondary assessment. Now, these are the three actions which we have to take. But how do we approach to these three actions? Whenever we have a patient, emergency patient with us, the first thing, the emergency can happen anywhere. It can happen in hospital. It can happen anywhere outside hospital. So the first thing which we need to do is to establish the scene safety. So, so many people sitting out here, we can face an emergency even in a house which has caught fire or maybe uh, on the middle of the road. So we have to give emergency care, but first thing we have to do, establish a scene safety. So once we have established the scene safety, the next important step is that we have to have an initial impression of the patient, whether our patient is a conscious or an unconscious patient. If the patient is unconscious, then the steps would start with BLS assessment, that is basic life support assessment, followed by primary assessment, followed by secondary assessment. And if the patient impression is conscious, patient is conscious, patient is talking or telling his problem, then we will not go with BLS assessment. We will go with primary assessment followed by secondary assessment. So let us start with the first case scenario. The patient is unconscious. So what do we do in this scenario? As I told in my last slide, we start with basic life support, BLS assessment, okay? So what is the first step whenever we face a unconscious patient? We alert the emergency medical system. Remember, remember everyone. You cannot carry out a BLS, a BLS to the patient alone. You cannot give BLS, basic life support to a patient alone for a long time. So you need to call for the help and you should ask for automated external defibrillator and a manual resuscitator. So I will just show you the manual. This is the automated external defibrillator. You can see this is automated external defibrillator and that is manual. I'll show the manual resuscitator and that is manual resuscitator. In BLS training, you need to be familiar with these two equipments. Well, remember one thing for sure that for BLS training, you don't need to have a very advanced knowledge of medical system or medical equipments or anything, but these two equipments, automated external defibrillator and a manual resuscitator is, would be very helpful to give a BLS support to any patient. So I have called for help. Now what I will do, I will check for the catheter pulse and the breathing of the patient. So as you can see, whenever we face a patient who is unconscious, we check the catheter pulse in an adult and then we see the breathing. We see the catheter pulse and we see the breathing. As you can see, my colleague is showing you how to feel for the catheter pulse and her eyes is on the chest of the patient to assess the breathing of the patient. So these two things, the pulse assessment and the breathing would establish whether the patient is in cardiac arrest or not. If pulse is present with no breathing, there could be three scenario guys. There could be three scenarios. If pulse and breathing, the carotid pulse and breathing, both are there, then the patient is not in cardiac arrest. Then what do we do? We wait for the ambulance to come. We wait for the ambulance to come. If pulse is present, she could feel the carotid pulse, but there is no movement of the chest. 
that means there is no breathing. So patient is not in cardiac arrest, patient is in respiratory arrest. In this case, my colleague will show you how to open the airway and give a rescue breath. Show, show how to open the airway and give the rescue breath. You can see this image. You can see this image. This is the way, you just, uh, just show how to open the airway. Don't, don't use the manual resuscitator. You can see in this image, there are two maneuvers, jaw thrust and head tilt and chin lift. By these two maneuver, we are opening the airway of the patient and giving the rescue breath. So how she will give the rescue breath? She will just take one normal tidal volume breath and attach to the oral cavity and the nose of the patient and she will give the breath, okay? Or, so this is how we give if the carotid pulse is there, but there is no, no breathing. And the third scenario is both pulse and the breathing is absent. So patient is in cardiac arrest. This is cardiac arrest. So we will start with high quality chest compression. So just see this uh, flow chart. This is American Heart Association, BLS flow chart. And when a person is in cardiac arrest, come on the, this part of the flow chart. This is when the person is in cardiac arrest. We start with high quality chest compression. So my colleague will demonstrate how to do high quality chest compression. Okay, show. So she, what she has done, she has taken one hand on the lower part of the sternum. And as you can see, her elbow is straight and she has interlocked her other hand on the hand present on the chest of the patient. And now by her entire weight on the chest of the patient, she is compressing. So this is how, and you can, you can just watch that when she's compressing, she's allowing a complete recoil. She's allowing a complete recoil. So, okay, stop. So what are the five points of high quality chest compression? Chest compression should be at the rate of 100 to 120 compression per minute. Compress at least five centimeter. The depth should be at least five centimeter. Allow a complete chest recoil. Avoid excessive ventilation. We should never give uh, excessive ventilation because that will further compromise the cardiac output by compromising the venous return of the patient. And we should switch the compressor about every two minutes. Remember, when one person is compressing the chest for a longer time, then the quality of compression would definitely suffer. So one should switch the compressor every two minutes if possible, if there is more than one person present. Okay, so these are the five points for high quality chest compression. And guys, very important. If I am doing five high quality chest compression, we are maintaining 30% of the cardiac output. And if I am not doing high quality chest compression, I'm not even maintaining that 30%. So it is not, it would not be a useful compression. So we have to do a high quality chest compression. Okay, so, so what I'm trying to tell you that there is three important, three important uh, intervention in basic life support. Number one, high quality chest compression. As you can see, this is a Yeah, 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 yeah
Possible that is wide QRS complex, no P base, only QRS complex. A would be a straight line and consciousness electrical Are shockable rhythm as I already told you. These are shockable rhythm, so you have to give shock as soon as possible, guys. In 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 because the normal activity of heart the normal uh, uh, activity of heart is the sinus rhythm so we stop the heart and we pray that heart should resume the sinus rhythm that's why we give shock so we should give shock as soon as possible the other two intervention as you can see in this uh, this uh, flow chart is that we should put an iv line and give injection adrenaline adrenaline One milligram, one in ten thousand, and repeat it after every three to five minutes. Why do we give adrenaline? To maintain the perfusion by maintaining a vasoconstriction, and we can use one more drug, a mutarone, that is a antiarrhythmic. We give two doses of a mutarone, one after another, three hundred milligram followed by one one fifty milligram bolus, and no other intervention. We give shock every two minutes after CPR. If the rhythm is shockable, that is VF and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, we give injection adrenaline every three to five minutes, and we can give amiodarone for two doses, three hundred milligram and one fifty milligram. No other intervention for managing VF and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. And remember, guys, you can save the life if you recognize these two rhythm and give shock as early as possible. Studies have shown that if the time interval between shock delivery And the VF, the cardiac arrest, is minimal. Chances of ROS, that is return of spontaneous circulation, is best. Okay. Then the other two rhythm is our asystole and pulseless electrical activity. These are non-shockable rhythm. Remember, in asystole, there is no movement of the heart, 
and in pulses electrical activity there is an electrical activity but there is no mechanical output because there is no pulse the reason may be that heart is empty that is there is no blood in the heart so if you give shock it would be of no benefit so what you have to do you have to find the cause treat the cause and then only the cardiac arrest would be reversed so in these two type of rhythm the only thing you have to do you have to give chest compression cpr and you have to give injection adrenaline every 3 to 5 minutes repeat it every 3 to 5 minutes no shock no amidrone right no antiarrhythmic so these this is the only intervention and try to find the cause so this is how we manage asystole and pulseless electrical activity so this is how we approach a patient who is unconscious and in cardiac arrest now let us say scenario 2 patient is conscious then we will not go for bls we would immediately go for primary assessment followed by secondary assessment so primary assessment the primary assessment stands for a b c d e airway breathing circulation disability and exposure so in a conscious patient who is not in cardiac arrest we have to look the airway of the patient whether the airway is patent or not if airway is not patent we do a simple airway maneuver like head tilt and chin lift and try to maintain, maintain the patency of the airway if patient's airway is not we are not able to maintain the patency we can use the advanced airway device we have to confirm whether we have put the advanced airway device properly or not for that we have so many other devices like capnography and if required we should put the endotracheal tube then the second thing we have to do is see the breathing whether the patient's ventilation and oxygenation is adequate or not well patient may require a positive pressure ventilation right so we need to support the ventilation in that case or patient may require only a mask oxygen mask to be attached to him so we try to maintain the oxygenation of the patient between 90 to 94% and in cardiac arrest patient we always give 100% oxygen but for other patient who are not in cardiac arrest we give enough oxygen to maintain the oxygenation between 90 to 94% it is not necessary always to give everyone 100% oxygen remember oxygen is a double edged sword it is vital it is required but it can be toxic as well so always give enough oxygen to maintain oxygenation between 90 to 94% in a conscious patient requiring a support for airway and breathing but in a cardiac arrest always 100% oxygen okay then we see the circulation if patient is in cardiac arrest the circulation is assessed how how we are maintaining the circulation in cardiac arrest by chest compression so we have to see that our chest compression should be effective then we have to recognize the rhythm of the cardiac arrest we have to manage accordingly whether defibrillation is required or not we have to put iv line we have to see what type of rhythm patient has if patient is a conscious patient whether it is a tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia we have to recognize the rhythm and manage accordingly and we have to give those medications which would convert those rhythm in a sinus rhythm right so we have to manage the circulation accordingly then disability we have to see the neurological status of the patient avpu a very simple way to assess the neurological status whether the person is alert or whether the person is responding to the voice verbal command or responding to pain or patient is simply unresponsive so we call it avpu exposure once we have done a b c d right e a b c d then we definitely have to see about exposure as well why because if we will not expose the patient completely and see if we, we if we expose the patient definitely we can have an idea of etiology why the patient has gone into cardiac arrest maybe a trauma patient bleeding from some proper some site maybe from fracture maybe patient is in uh, let's say uh, cardiac tamponade case if we'll expose and auscultate the patient but we can try to find the etiology by exposing the patient and assessing the patient accordingly so this is a b c d e the primary assessment then comes secondary assessment the secondary assessment is the assessment done to find the cause cause of the current status of the patient why the patient has gone into cardiac arrest or why the patient is in acute emergency right and the secondary assessment can be done can be done easily by remembering few things first we have to take a very focused history if patient is not unconscious and patient can give the history we'll take it from patient 
and if patient is in cardiac arrest we will take it from the attendant or the person who has brought the patient and we will have a focus history because we have to gather a lot of information in a very small time period and a mnemonic sample helps us in taking that focused history sample may s stands for sign and symptoms what is the presence of sign and symptoms if the patient is conscious patient is dyspneic patient is in uh, patient is in unstable chest pain patient complaining chest is not being maintained so signs and symptoms okay then we have to take a quick history of any allergy of the patient any medications patient takes patient may be on diuretic the possibility of potassium sparing diuretic and hypokalemia we will will think about hypokalemia and is the cause of current condition of the patient we will look the past medical history patient was a patient of cardiac a problem and maybe patient is in acute coronary syndrome maybe patient is having acute ischemia and because of a big ischemia patient is in current current clinical condition so we'll take a very fast medical past we'll take a very fast past medical history then we'll uh, just have a, a history about when the patient had his last meal because we have to see whether patient will aspirate or not in present condition and event the event which which put the patient in the current scenario the series of event which had put the patient in the current scenario so this sample would help us now apart from sample in the secondary assessment we have to remember about 5 h and 5 t's of cardiac arrest or acute emergency 5 h and 5 t's of cardiac arrest or acute emergency so what is 5 h and 5 t's h stands for the 5 h stands for hypoxia hypovolemia acidosis hypothermia hypohypokalemia so very quickly we will rule out these five causes which could have led the patient in current clinical condition or which has led the patient into cardiac arrest so we'll rule out these four these five condition then five t's would be tension pneumothorax cardiac tamponade pulmonary thrombosis coronary thrombosis and toxin so we'll rule out these five conditions also that is any of these condition responsible for the current clinical status of the patient because guys as fast as uh, as soon as possible we find the cause the chances of restoring the ventilation and circulation of the patient would be fastest and there would be a chance to revert the patient uh now one thing i want to tell you that all these we can do by our simple investigations simple investigations like abg which you read in the last session which you understood in the last session like cbc abg and a uh, simple by auscultation palpitation of the patient etc clinical examination now one very good advance equipment which we have which is helping us nowadays and which has become like stethoscope for intensivist in icu and that is our ultrasound machine if someone is in acute emergency or is in cardiac arrest this bedside ultrasonography would help us in many way this could help us in diagnosing pulmonary embolism this could help us in diagnosing a uh, pericardial tamponade and this could help us in diagnosing a uh, lot of other contention pneumothorax etc remember guys whether it is pulmonary thrombosis or pericardial tamponade or it is uh, tension pneumothorax these condition causing cardiac arrest if you will not do a definitive management of these condition it would be very difficult to reverse the patient from cardiac arrest so we need to find the cause and bedside ultrasonography simple effective equipment in helping us to do if we don't have a proper training in bedside ultrasonography not a big deal by simple clinical examination by simple auscultation by simple investigation we can try to find the cause so this is how we do a systematic assessment of a patient in acute emergency whether in cardiac arrest or not in cardiac arrest okay so uh, so thank you so much for your patient listening any question you are most welcome yeah please go ahead Uh, for male and female, pregnant. Yeah, there are mics. 
Ma'am, uh, are there any uh, changes in the AHA guidelines for any pregnant female if, if uh, ANC patient comes and we have to give CPCR? So okay. there might be few difference. Uh, so there are there? definitely, thank you so much. Now, there are definitely so, uh, differences in managing a cardiac arrest in a pregnant lady compared to a normal, uh, normal patient. Uh, see, in a pregnant lady, most of the steps are same. But there are few important things which we need to be focused on. In a pregnant lady, after 20 weeks of gestation, there is what we need to do. We need to lift the uterus away from the major vessels. So we have to do a left uterine displacement, right? Left uterine displacement. And the very important thing which you asked was, was there any modification in this latest guideline of AHA? See, previously the AHA used to say that you just do a left, a left by a left up, you do a left uterine displacement. But nowadays, AJ says, keep the patient supine and do a manual displacement so that patient remain in a supine position for a better chest compression. If you will tilt the patient for the uh, uterine displacement, the chest compression would not be efficient. So keep the patient supine, do a manual displacement, and then give chest compression. Chest compression, the site, the steps, the rate, Everything is same, 100 to 120, everything. The other important thing in a pregnant lady is that, that when you put the IV line into the intravenous cannula for managing the uh, patient, try to put it above diaphragm, right? Again, because of the pressure of gravid uterus on the major vessel. So try to keep it in the above the diaphragm. The third important thing is that if you're unable to resuscitate a pregnant lady within five, four to five minutes, then go, get, do a perimortem caesarean section. Take the baby out. Because even if the baby is not viable, because the mother is a priority. And if you will separate the baby, the chances of resuscitation would be better. And one more very important thing. The pregnant ladies, young patients, they are young patients and they give ample time before going into cardiac arrest. So try to do, do try not to put land these patients in cardiac arrest. Try to man try to prevent the condition which is producing cardiac arrest whether the lady is in hypoxia or she is having uh, let's say a hypovolemia anything manage that and try to prevent her landing in cardiac arrest try to do a pre assessment carefully in these patients okay any other question so you can come here uh, thank you, Dr. Swati, for excellent talk, excellent deliberation, excellent.